Good afternoon, gentlemen, and happy Friday. I sit here again, surrounded by the wisdom of ages past, including our dear friend, Mr. Shakespeare, with Romeo and Juliet. That'll become important later. Yesterday, we were talking about the various kinds of love. And one of the things that we noted was that agape, caritas, is often defined as love rightly ordered. So that when we talk about the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, charity is loving properly loving God for his own sake and loving other things because they are beloved creatures of God. Well, this raises the question, if there's such a thing as love rightly ordered, is there such a thing as love wrongly ordered, disordered love? Sadly, the answer is yes, and it doesn't take too long for us to look around the world and see examples of wrongly ordered love, of disordered love. And that's going to be the focus of our discussion today. It's going to be a fairly brief video. We've only got one slide really to cover. And then I'm going to spend about four or five minutes at the end discussing and breaking down the catechism readings that you're going to be having assessments on next week. So with that, let's waste no more time and start talking about disordered loves. As we discuss the issue of love, we immediately come across a problem. Not all of it is good. Some love is, in fact, tainted love, as Gloria Jones and then later Soft Cell pointed out. Incidentally, the music video to Soft Cell is going to be included down below in the description with the 1981 video that made the song oh so famous. So we recognize with songs like Tainted Love that there is such a thing as bad love. Not all love in this world is good. So if that's the case, if it is in fact true that not all loves are good, what is it that makes some loves bad? Why is there such a thing as tainted love? Well, this can happen for one of two reasons. First of all, love can have an improper object. The thing we are directing our love towards is wrong, or the person we're directing our love towards is wrong for some reason or another. Most famously, Paul says in the first letter to Timothy, the love of money is the root of all evil. So that if I am valuing things or other uh, objects in the way that I should be valuing human beings, this is a problem. Think, for instance, of that great statement in The Big Lebowski about the, uh, the pornographer. He treats objects like women, man. This is his complaint about Jackie Treehorn. He takes these objects and he treats them as though they were flesh and blood women. A little bit of a malapropism, but oddly enough, a perfect description for what is sometimes wrong about our loves. Or, for some reason, it might be improper for us to direct our love towards that person in that particular time. In the music video Tainted Love, for instance, the 1981 video, the main character has a realization as he sees his daughter before him, he looks at his wife and he looks at the slave who is fanning them both with ostrich feathers and recognizes, my little girl has that man's eyes. There is more of a resemblance between that person and that person than there is between that person and me. And with that realization, he realizes that the woman he loves has a tainted love for this other individual. So that her love, she and this slave individual, this slave boy, they have a tainted love for one another. Their expression of eros towards one another is improper. Because the fact of the matter is, that eros on its own can be a good thing unless something like the context of matrimony means I should not be expressing eros towards that individual. My eros should only be chosen, should only be willed towards my wife. To do otherwise would lead to a number of different issues. He, we can also see that in that music video, he has a complaint about how this woman loves. Her own love, as we listen to the lyrics, her own love for herself has really twisted her love for all other individuals so that she no longer cares about how she hurts this individual, what she does to their children, what she does to their family. Her own love has become so selfish. And so we can have our own selves as an improper object of love if we love ourselves too greatly. And when we talk about an improper object of love, Sometimes an individual or a thing is always improper, no question. Sometimes the object is improper because we are giving too much love or too little. 
the object is wrong because the amount of love that we are giving to that individual is wrong in some way, shape, or form. The other reason that the love can be a problem is that it can be expressed in destructive ways. Think, for instance, of Romeo and Juliet. In the end scene of Romeo and Juliet, their love ends up being destructive. We had talked yesterday about how the love that Romeo and Juliet had for one another, that eros that they had, was a true and good thing. And originally in that play, initially, their love was indeed a good one. There's a reason why we look at the love of Romeo and Juliet and say, this is in many ways the standard for love. But through the various trials and tribulations that go on throughout the play, the love becomes more and more destructive until finally Romeo and Juliet are led to kill one or each other over not being able to be with the other. Romeo commits suicide over his thinking that Juliet is already dead. And then Juliet, seeing Romeo dead, takes the dagger and says, oh, happy knife, here is thy sheath. And plunges it into herself and says, there rust, killing herself and dying. That love, that eros for Romeo, which started out as so good and so wholesome, ends up expressing itself in a very destructive way. Think as well about the difference between patriotism and nationalism. Both of them at their root. When we talk about patriotism and nationalism in Unit 1, when we were talking about ordered versus disordered goods, in both cases, we saw that the root of patriotism and nationalism was a love of country. Love of country is a good thing. It is a good and holy thing to love the place where you're from. Patriotism, however, takes that love of country and allows it to be a more inclusive thing. I love my country and I also then respect other people who love their country. Nationalism is an expression of love for country and a love of one's homeland that leads to destructive things. So that my love for country and my love for where I am can eventually become, I hate other people who are from different places, or I'm even going to do physical violence to people who are from different places. So that nationalism and that patriotism in both cases is based on that a same basic kind of love, a love of country. The expression, however, becomes a problem and we're going to see why momentarily. Ultimately, however, as St. Augustine points out, there is not one who does not love something. The question is what to love. All of us love. Aristotle is going to say, the good is that which all things seek. Augustine is going to say as well, love is something that all humans do. All of us are loving individuals in some way, shape, or form. The question is not whether or not we are loving. The question is, who do we love? What do we love? How do we love? Think of Aristotle's dictum for virtue. Aristotle is going to say that it is virtuous to be angry, for instance. If I am angry at the right person, to the right degree, for the right reason, for the right duration, we can say likewise for love. Love, if I love a person to the right degree, for the right duration, for the right reasons, and all the rest, that love is a virtuous thing. That love becomes a good thing. If I love a person for the wrong reasons, or if I love a person in a wrong way or to the wrong degree, then we have a problem. If, for instance, I have an eros towards an individual that I should really only have a philia towards, this is an issue. Or if I fail to have storge for an individual, think of Conrad's mother, for instance, think of Beth. She had the obligation of motherhood, and yet she was not able to love her son. She was not able to choose to have the proper love for her son that a mother rightly should have. Ultimately then, what we see is that there are ordered and disordered loves. There are good and bad ways to love, and the question is, how do I order that love? And it's a very similar problem as ordered versus disordered goods. And very often, the way that we can tell the difference between an ordered versus a disordered love is going to be the same way that we tell, is this an ordered or a disordered good? My love for Sal Snowballs, for instance, can be an ordered love if it allows me to live a good and healthy life. My love for a woman could be a good and holy thing if it allows me to express my love in a good and healthy way. My love for my country is a good thing if it includes other individuals. And that's the key. 
just as an ordered good is a good that keeps in mind all of the various goods that we should be thinking about, so too a love is a good and ordered love if it considers all of the other things that we should be loving. Juliet, for instance. Juliet had a good and healthy love for Romeo until her love for Romeo led her to neglect the proper love and care for one's own life that one should naturally have. And so her love for Romeo became disordered because it cut out from the scene the love for herself that she was all supposed to have, also supposed to have. And in that way became a disordered love. My love for my homeland is a good and holy thing until it edges out the love for neighbor and love for other people that I should properly have. This is going to be at the heart of an ordered versus a disordered love. Ultimately though, as we continue to explore what does it mean to love in an ordered way, what we're going to have to do is to say, how did God ultimately create us to be? What was the order that God gave to all creatures when he made us and when he said, this is love, this is human beings, this is matrimony. And that is going to be the subject of our next presentation as we look at human love and the divine plan, as we see how things were in the beginning and what human love and human family was supposed to be in the age before sin, when God first created us and placed us in the Garden of Eden. As we have seen, there are many kinds of love in our lives, some good, some not so good. Hopefully we keep the ideal ever in mind so that we have an idea of this is what my love should be. And as we see what our love should be, we can then also see this is how my family should be organized. This is how society should be organized. All of these wonderful things. And speaking of how family should be organized, let's talk a little bit about what the catechism readings for this coming week are going to be looking like. There's going to be three reading assessments, one on families, one on the duties of parents, and then one on sins against chastity and sins against matrimony. The family section is going to talk a lot about the way in which families are formed and the relationship between families and societies. Pay particular attention to the fact that families are based upon the consent and love of the parents and that families have a particular relationship with society and that governments have an obligation to recognize the goodness of families and to allow families to form. If you think about how families really are one of the great vocations of individuals and how they allow us to grow, governments then, it becomes very clear how governments have an obligation to help individuals build themselves up and become everything that the Lord has created them to be. This is really at the heart of what it means for governments to issue any kinds of laws. And so when government enacts laws of all sorts, they're, try, they're trying to do so in order to build up human beings and especially to build up families, one of those great vocations that we can enter into and learn how to be truly who we were made to become. After this, it's going to talk, we're going to have readings on parents and what it means to be a parent. Ultimately, families are for the good of the spouse and the propagation of children. And parents have a solemn duty as the first educators of children and the primary educators of children. These are the individuals who are supposed to be taking care of kids. Everybody else, myself included, all teachers, basically we are acting in loco parentis. We are acting in the place of parents, helping them to do things that they aren't necessarily able to do themselves on the logic that perhaps not every parent is, for instance, great at calculus or biology or English literature or all of the other things that children need to learn in order to grow into responsible, mature individuals. That's sometimes why we have schools. It's basically a way of parents subcontracting their responsibilities. But parents always have the first obligation and a large amount of veto power over the way in which their children are formed to become members of society. The final section is going to be on sins against matrimony and sins against chastity. Two things to bear in mind with these reading assessments. First of all, in both cases, with sins against chastity and then sins against matrimony, the sections in the catechism begin with reflections upon the ideal. This is the ideal of chastity and how all Christians are called to chastity by virtue of their baptism. This is the ideal of matrimony and what matrimony should look like. And then in each case, so we have the ideal and then deviations from the ideal. 
the ideal of matrimony, and then the deviations. Always remember, these, when we call these things sins, it is for the sake of protecting the ideal. Always, always, always. The no is always at the service of some greater yes. And it's also helpful to remember in the reading assessments. So the vocabulary quiz is going to deal much more about the what. So you're going to get a matching section and then this is the sin. The reading assessments for sins against matrimony and the sins against chastity is going to be more focused on the why. So a reading assessment question might give you, ask for you the definition of adultery. The reading assessment is going to ask, why is adultery wrong? And that's going to be something you're going to want to bear in mind as you do this reading. I suspect, however, that many of these definitions are words that you've come into contact with before. And the reasons for the sins and why the sins are what they are, I think are going to be fairly intuitive. With that, gentlemen, have a good weekend. And remember... Stay away from that tainted love.